Actually, the day I left Minnesota, the temperature went from below zero to 50 degrees above. So, <laughs> but I'm happy to be here. It's beautiful, and Minnesota does not have an ocean, so this is great. Um, so I was reading about the Thoracic Surgery Club, and um, it brought back a lot of memories. Um, I went to medical school at Mayo, and at that time, Dr. Paralero was head of thoracic surgery, and he was an icon to all the medical students. He was kind of in the pantheon of unbelievable Mayo surgeons back then, and still is. And, um, and Vic Trastic was actually the chief resident in one of my surgical services, and he was always just a great teacher for all the residents. Um, it was wonderful, um, his services. And um, Phil Bernatz was another surgeon who I just admired so much at Mayo. Um, he's just kind and gentle and great. So, and um, I haven't dealt, I went into pediatric radiology after medical school, so I haven't dealt with thoracic surgery again until I got into 3D printing. And then when we got into 3D printing, we've worked with a lot of the thoracic surgeons, and I'm just reminded about what a creative, fun, energetic group they are. And, and when we got into 3D printing, we bring it to different groups, and the thoracic surgeons kind of jumped on it we're, unexpectedly. We're like, wow. And they stop by all the time and say, can you do this? Can you try this? Can you do this? So it's really an honor to be invited here by um, Dr. Allen to speak to everybody. So I'm going to share our experience at Mayo talk a little bit about you know 3D printing. I know everybody hears about it in the news all the time. Um, and just talk a little bit about it and talk about what we're doing in our experience. So that's a great logo. So 3D printing, other names are like rapid prototyping and additive manufacturing. Um, it has the name of rapid prototyping because in the very beginning it was just thought to be used for prototype for manufacturing. They were going to use it to develop prototypes. If they worked, they were going to go on to manufacturing. But it was so good that people just started using them instead of a prototype straight out. And additive manufacturing is because it's not like a milling process where you take anything away. It's, you're growing it. And so it's additive as opposed to subtractive manufacturing. So those are terms that float around. When you get into this, you're going to learn a whole new set of, of terminology and, and uh, it's, it's very interesting. I didn't think at my age I would be into this whole new field. But So when you think about 3D printing, what is it? It's kind of like the pyramids. You take a layer, and you put another layer, and another layer, and another layer, until you've gotten what you want to create from it. So it's kind of a simple but elegant way to think about it. Um, and one of the things that um, is kind of basic for 3D printing to understand is the STL file. So what we take is all the imaging data in the DICOM files. So I always like to say, if you can image it in a DICOM file, we can translate it into an STL file and we can print it. Um, again, there's a lot of initials in all of this and, and you kind of have to get used to them. So an STL file really um, takes this and translates it, everything into triangles. And so what we're doing is we're recreating those triangles. Um, with software. And so the thinner the slices that we use, the smaller the triangles, the higher the resolution. So just kind of keep that in mind as we go through. And so everything, all the images that we have from the STL file, so everything we create actually is, is a bunch of triangles put together from the CT data. And I brought along some models. If anybody wants to see them there on the front table, just to kind of get an idea of what they look like. And um, well, let me just ask how many people um, have 3D printing at their institutions, just so I get a good. So people are familiar with it. Great. Um, so uh, so here's when we make the 3D printer. This is the slicing software. So you lay down layer upon layer upon layer, and they're very very thin slices. So the slices at our institution are like 30 microns in the printer that we have. It's a Conex 350 printer. So that's a vertebral body. Um, and just a short history of 3D printing. Um, so it uses computer assisted design to assemble these thin layers of very thin material to create a three-dimensional product. It was initially used in manufacturing, and there's different types of it. So there's, if you start looking to machines, you look at these different types, and they're all a little bit different. They all have their pluses and minuses. Some only do one color, some do multiple colors, some do translucent. So you have to look in the different types. But it really started developing in the 80s. That's when the first patents came out. And you'll notice the prices of 3D printers are coming down, and that's because a lot of these patents are disappearing. And so people are able to get into the market and create more 3D printers. So you're going to see them come down even more in the next couple of years. But these are the different types that are available. We use a polyjet printer from Conex 350. 
So this is from um, a meeting in 2009 where a lot of people in 3D printing got together and said, what, is the, you know, what are the future of 3D printing? Um, and they talked about a lot of different things, um, but we kind of look at it in what's the future of 3D printing in medicine. And so from our experience, we started off with anatomic models. They're very important in patient education. When you make these and show a patient their individualized model from whatever their disease is, it, it just really is a very powerful thing. It's, it, you know, they're very, you know, very happy to have it. They understand things better. It's one of the real positive things about it. Medical education, it has a huge role in medical education. Surgical planning. And we're also developing now cutting guides um, for our surgeons to use mainly in orthopedics. Also work on implants, bioprinting, which Dr. Ott just talked about. And, and we see the future, even though we are not doing any of this, this is part of 3D printing, and we see some overlap with what we do. Regenerative medicine, research. One of our people is really interested in forensic 3D printing and has gotten involved with that with our pathologists and custom stent sizing. So that's part of the future of it. You hear about 3D printed food. Um, I think that, I get, this is just a, another slide showing all the different uses of it, but the medical part is what we're very involved in. So um, one of the early uses was really with prosthetics. Um, so using hand prosthetics, you've heard of the robot maker, you know, that uses, makes hands for um, very inexpensively for people that don't have them, also for braces. Um, also for bioengineering. This is some work from Wake Forest with skin regeneration, which is extremely impressive. Um, so how about anatomic models? What happened, I think, is that 3D printing really evolved in the 80s and 90s, and then it converged in the 90s with high resolution um, imaging. So at that point, you know, you, we started getting CTs with really high, thin sections, like 1.5s, 1s, even down to 0.5s or 0.7s. So you started getting very high resolution images that you could then convert and use with 3D printers to get really nice models. Before that, you would get really thicker models that wouldn't be high resolution. So it really came together at that in the 90s, I think. Initially, it was used in dental and cranial facial work. I always think the dentists are way ahead of us in a lot of stuff. So they've been doing this since the 90s, and they all they already have CPT codes. They get you know reimbursed for it, but um, we're kind of catching up with them. But now, in the last really, I would say um, five years, um, it's really expanded into a lot of orthopedic, neurosurgical, liver, kidney, and cardiovascular work. The models below are some of the things that we've done. Um, and I'll show a little bit more of those. How did we begin? I think we began in radiology um, when the surgeons came to us. They said, could you do this? It was a set of conjoined twins. I work a lot with Dr. Moyer in uh, Mayo, and, and uh, oh, in a two-year course, we had like three sets of conjoined twins. And at that point, we had done really I, what I thought was very nice high-resolution imaging, and he said, oh, could you make this into a model? And we thought, well, that's kind of nice, but you already have all the data, you know, but yeah, we'll do that. But when we made it into a model, we were so impressed with the surgeons being impressed. They just took the model, they said, this is great, they took it to the OR, they did surgical planning around it, it helped explain the procedure to everybody, it helped them in their thinking about it. It was just, you know, such a positive thing that we decided, oh, Maybe we should do more of this. And we went and got innovation funds for it. So this is one of our sets of conjoined twins. And they were joined through the liver and also through the thoracic cavity. And so we made this model of it. And it went to surgery. And I would just say, when you give these models to surgeons, and you're all surgeons, um, they always they quit talking to you. They take the model. And they start looking at the model and talking to the model and say, I'm going to cut here. I'm going to do that. I'm going to approach here. And everybody, it doesn't matter if it's orthopedic, neurosurgical, any, they, they do the same thing. So I just think, you know, there's this connection between the hands and the brain and, I mean, really for the surgeons. Um, and so that when you have this model in your hand, even though you have that data on the CT or the MR, t there's increased comprehension, there's more immediate comprehension, and that's what we see as a positive benefit. And I think you just have to talk to the surgeons who use it to see what they think as a positive benefit. But um, people keep coming back for more, so we keep making them. Um, so what are, what what is our workflow? Well, the first thing is um, we think this is a really collaborative thing. Um, so it's between the surgeons, the radiologists, and we have biomedical engineers. So it's really something you do together. We actually gave a course this last winter, and, and we named it Collaborative 3D Printing in Medicine. 
and we had as many surgeons talk as radiologists, and we had as many surgeons come to the meeting as radiologists, um, and Dr. Blackman came and talked at it, and really um, very enthusiastic group. I think it was kind of like getting a lot of hackers together at a hackers convention. People were just really, they didn't leave the room, and they kept staying and talking, and everybody's business cards had been handed totally out at the end of it. But anyway, so we get together. This is Dr. Morris, who heads the lab with me with Dr. Rose, one of our oncological orthopedic surgeons, who uses this a lot for his complex cases. So I would say that also. This isn't for your everyday case or simple case. These are, tend to be for complex cases where it really helps. You know, there's a lot going on, and also where you have multidisciplinary teams working on the same case, because then it really helps everybody discuss it with that patient's anatomy right there. So we consult with them, and then we take the data, and we bring it over um, to our software system, and then we start segmenting it. When you hear segmenting it, that is that you separate the different parts of anatomy that you want to print, and you separate them by color that you want to print them. So you know we make the bones separate from the vessels, separate from the tumor, separate from the bladder, separate from you know the brachial plexus. Everything is separated into colors so that when you print it, they come in colors like that. And it's, too bad when you do surgery, it isn't all color-coded like that. It makes it a lot easier, but anyway. Um, and then we take that and we make it into a 3D model, and then we make it into an STL file. We print that file. It's taken over to our 3D printer, so all printers use this STL file. It's that common communication between. We have, when we print ours, we have a support system around it, so it comes out looking kind of like there's a snowstorm around it, but you wash that off, and then you get the final model. So that was, one, that was the chondrosarcoma of the pelvis that we did for Dr. Rose. So if you haven't seen it, this is what it looks like. Um, if you have seen it, it's kind of like watching the waves in the ocean. You just kind of, everybody stands there and just watches it. You can just kind of get mesmerized by it. But, um, so that's what it looks like. And a model like that for our printer probably takes um, a day and a half to print. Something small like carpal bones you can print in an hour or two. Just depends on the size of what you're printing, how long it takes to print. So what happened with us, we started with the um, conjoined twins and we got a little bit of in money for innovation. And we st so we did maybe six to eight a year and it kind of grew. Um, so we started, this was with fused liver of one of the twins. This, these are some of the carpal bones. We really started out in orthopedic work, did a lot of spines. So vertebral anomalies um, that, you know, uh, with scoliosis that had really complex anatomy. We were helping orthopedic surgeons. This is another liver that we did for a set of conjoined twins. And at this point, we were able to embed the bile ducts within the liver. And Dr. Moyer um, kind of planned the surgery around where those bile ducts were. So when he showed us where he was going to cut the liver, and then we were able, on the computer, to cut the liver into two pieces and print it as two pieces. Um, so they felt that was really helpful. This is one of the early um, tumor patients that we did. This is another chondrosarcoma for Dr. Rose. But you can see why our volume, our volume went up a lot in 2013 and 2014. So where we had done about 8 to 10 a year, um, the next year we did about... Um, I think it was over 100 models. So what happened in 2013? We got our own lab. We moved from the engineering department to the hospital. And if people are interested in developing this, I would say that was a key thing because we put it, it's interesting to me, um, this is on 6 Joseph, Dr. Paralero is here. This, that was the old amphitheater for the old surgical suites at Mayo. And they have these beautiful windows, they look out. Um, and so it's kind of memorable, I think, that we're there. Um, but it's also not very far away from the surgical suites um, and, and that surgeons can stop in between cases, before and after cases. People stop in all the time. They look at what we're doing. They say, can you do this? Can you do that? How about that? It's kind of like an incubator. And it really took off once we got it in the hospital setting. Um, and it's not a very big room, but we have printers and computers and we are planning to expand. So what have we done? We do skulls, hearts, orthopedics, chest, um, Kind of, I say, if, you know, if you can image it, we can print it. Um, there's small, the large. Some of the um, small ones are easy to do. Some of the small ones, like one of the congenital hearts we have, take many hours to do. Some of the large ones, like skulls, are fairly easy to do. And some of the larger ones with the complex tumors take a long time to do. So it's really variable the time that it takes to do it. We're getting much better. We probably cut it in half, our segmentation time, because we've learned how to do it. Um, the printing time hasn't changed. 
So here's one of the ones from Dr. Shen that was one of our first thoracic ones that we did, and this was a patient with a, a pancos tumor. So we segmented out the vessels, we segmented out the brachial plexus, which is up here. And to do the brachial plexus, we can't get that on CT, but we get that on MR. That's the outline of it. So we take the MR and the CT and we're able to merge those together as long as you have common accurate points that you feel comfortable overlaying on each other. These are the different, um, and so this is the 3D model that we had and it shows the, the tumor here, the pancos tumor here, the vessels, the brachial plexus. And here is the final model. So this is another one, and Dr. the same Dr. Shen took this to surgery with Dr. Rose, and, and they used it to, just to help in surgery. So this is another, just an illustration, this is another pancos tumor of how we do the segmentation. So we take the bones, which are fairly easy to segment. Um, we add the trachea, again, the trachea, because of the difference in density being air-filled, is fairly easy to segment. The tumor, um, the vessels, the vessels, the great vessels, the pulmonary arteries and veins, and then the brachial plexus. So we take that, we convert it into an STL file, and we print it. This is also, and I'll talk a little bit about it later, is great for teaching. So when you're trying to explain this anatomy to anybody, medical students, residents, fellows, this is just, because it's color-coded, it's so much easier to understand and to understand relationships. Um, so it's really a great teaching tool, and I think it's going to be one of the, I, I feel like in the future, at least a fourth of what we're going to do is going to be education-based. Um, and you can rotate this around on our, on our computer screen. You can do PDFs, and you can change it and turn it and have different organs come in and out. But it's a really nice illustration. This is a 3D printed model of that. Um, so this, you can see there was um, extension of tumor um, over the ribs. It involved the um, T2, T3 nerve roots. Um, the brachial plexus was up here, the great vessels. After we're done, we also are a small photography studio now, and we take a lot of photos of it. So this is the tumor, I mean, this is the model from different angles. This is another one um, that we did for Dr. Kasibi. This patient had a lot of esophageal diverticuli. Um, we were able to give them contrast in water and outline the esophagus along with the great vessels. Um, this was our 3D uh, virtual model of it, um, so the, esoph the esophageal diverticula with the aorta. And, and again, we asked the surgeons, what do you want included? And so Dr. Kasibi said, oh, we want the diaphragm included. And you know, in radiology, we hardly look at the diaphragm unless it's not working. Otherwise, it's just this thin structure that separates the chest and the abdomen. But after hand segmenting this diaphragm through, I don't know how many, 120 CT slices, I feel like I got to intimately know it and I understand it so much better. And um, so now we, we, put, we tend to put the diaphragm on anything we do for the thoracic surgeons that goes down that low because we know it's important. I guess that's the other thing in radiology. We've kind of, this has helped us learn important things for the surgeons that we didn't know. Like I didn't know the clavicles were important. So the first one we did, there was no clavicle. And Dr. Kasibi said, oh, there's gotta be a clavicle. It's like the border between France and Germany. It's very important to know where it is. <laughs> so we've included the clavicle and everything. And then the first rib. Again, we didn't know it was so important, and it's like, oh no, we have to know where the first rib is. So it's been good for us to know what's important because there's some things you just, in radiology, have no idea because you're not doing the surgery. But So just landmarks, we realize how important landmarks are. This is another model, and this is for Dr. Blackman, and this is a patient who'd had a um, emergent left pneumonectomy with an aortic graft for an, an aortoesophageal fistula. And she said, boy, I would really like a model of this. And so we got a CT, and what we did was we put air in contrast up the esophagus through a gastrostomy and a Foley catheter at the same time that we were doing a CTA so we could get the vessels. That's the other thing. Some, I mean, again, these are, tend to be for complex patients, but if we know ahead of time that a model is needed, then we try and do our CT or imaging to really optimize to get everything that we need for that model in one study, one or two studies. So here's the segmentation, um, and again, the, we always do the great vessels, the bones, so the IVC, the diaphragm, the aorta, and then also the esophagus. We did the esophageal spit fistula with the trachea. This was the final 3D virtual model, and this was our final model that we did for her. And again, one of the things I think that's helpful for surgeries, these are life size. Um, and so when you take them to surgery, you, you know, it's not a miniature, it's not maximized, it's just this is the size that you're working with of that person. And so Dr. Blackman did take it to surgery. 
Um, and these are some of the other models. This one is a, a schwannoma of, of the thorax that we did for Dr. Weigel. This is another Pancos tumor. This is one I put in there because this is one we did from a CT at fives. And you can just kind of see more of the stair-steppy look for it. You just don't have the high resolution that you do when you have the thinner sections. So these are some of the other models. This is an infant model, and we brought that along. It's a 28-day-old that had rib fractures, um, and that was um, a, a case of non-accidental trauma. And we just we were doing the CT anyway because this infant also had other injuries. We thought, well, we'll just make a model of that and see what it looks like. And even me, I do pediatric radiology. I've done for 30 years, but when I just kind of saw that and held it, it was it was like wow. You realize how fragile it is, the size. It was really impressive. Um, um, this is the case on the right is a patient that had a congenital brachial plexopathy, and one of the orthopedic surgeons said, well, I want to do his, his shoulder because I have to reconstruct um, for the brachial plexopathy. So we were just going to do the shoulder, and he said, no, 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 I need to see everything. I need to see the opposite shoulder. I want to see the ribs. I want to see the clavicle because I need to think about it. I need to think how I'm going to attach things, and it helps me. And sometimes we ask the surgeons, well, what do you do with these? And I know Dr. Rose says, well, I, I take them home and put them under my pillow and sleep on them. Um, so it's, it's one of those things that you all know. And, and you know, a lot of times you just don't think immediately what you're going to do. You have to think about what are the possibilities, what about this, and what about that. And, and these models help with that. The one on the bottom is a case for Dr. Moyer, and that was a patient who had a hypoplastic right lung. And so he had mediastinal shift to the right. He also had tracheal stenosis, and, um, uh, and what they were talking about doing an aortoplexy on him to kind of pull the aorta up off the trachea because they thought that it was adding to his strider. And, and it wasn't as, it was on the CT, but it was so much more obvious when we did this film that he really couldn't do an aortoplexy because of the shift of the mediastinum. The, the aorta was farther to the right than the trachea, and he would have nothing in the sternum. The sternum was farther to the left than the aorta, so the aorta sat on the right side of the sternum. So he really does the aortopexy by going over the sternum and pulling the aorta up, but he couldn't do it here because the aorta was shifted to the right. And again, I think all that information was on the CT, but you know, when you look at the CT, you've got 200 images axial, you have 200 images coronal and sagittal, and your mind puts those all together. And it's not as really, I don't think, as accurate as having it all together in one image that you're looking at and holding on to. And, and that's kind of what we're learning doing, doing this. Um, this is another um, one that we just did recently. This was a large paraganglioma um, that Dr. Cassivi had. So we had the SVC here, the aorta here, the pulmonary artery wrapped around it, the trachea in the back of it. Um, and we did one model like this just of the mediastinum with the vessels, and we did another one, again, with the sternum, um, with the first rib, with the clavicle, and with the spine. Um, anyway, we looked at this and we thought, my gosh, how's he going to get that out of there? But it went fine. Um, and this is just some more of that, just kind of showing the different angles of it. And one of the things he thought was most helpful from this is that we showed all the small collaterals going out around the tumor and going up around the trachea. Um, and, and I think things like that that are on the CT, but when you, when you kind of focus down and just take out the anatomy that's the most of interest to you and print it, it becomes much more obvious. Um, and Dr. Foley, one of our cardiac radiologists, did that. So just kind of some examples. And Dr. Foley, this is another example, I think, of really the help of these models in complex cases. So this is a child that came down um, or came up from Central America that had a pulmonary atresia and had all these collaterals coming off her aorta. Um, and this is the CT that we did, and there's just so many vessels all over the place and what vessel comes from where. This was the virtual CT that was done, and it's a really nice study. Um, but even our pediatric congenital heart radiologist went to Tom and said, this is a good one for 3D modeling. So Tom took that data, segmented it out, all the vessels, the collaterals, pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, and he made this model, again, color-coded, and then actual size, um, and uh, Dr. Draney, our heart surgeon, just thought it was so helpful, and when he went in, he said it was exactly what it was like, and he kind of knew ahead of time where to go to cut vessels off and, and do surgery. So in, it's these kind of complex cases that I think is really helpful, but it did take Tom, I think, about eight hours to segment that all out. 
Um, and this is another one um, that Tom has done, and this is one of the areas I think that um, it can be used in, is this is a, a patient that was having a valve replaced, a tricuspid valve, and so Tom made a, a model of that, um, but then he also made a softer model that they could practice deployment of their valve in, and that's the image to the right on the bottom. And there, and then that, after the valve was placed, that was the CT that showed um, what it looked like. So it really was, I think, a nice simulator. Um, and I think that's some of the places that we're, you know, going to be seeing it used, that you can use it to simulate things. So I know that there's virtual simulation, but also actual size, actual model simulation is also there. And again, because it's physical, it has some additive value. So um, these are some of the things we've done, and there's an um, example there, an aortic arch that, um, or the ascending aorta, we're able to show the valve, the, the um, calcification, um, and, and, and the heart, and beautiful heart um, images from the CTAs. And the one on the right is pulmonary arteries, and, and those show thrombus in it. And they were doing uh, a study with thrombectomy. So physical anatomic models for surgical planning, they're an accurate reflection of an individual anatomy. Um, they allow really a direct way to understand some of that unique anatomy, and they contribute to care, we feel like, by pre-surgical decision-making, can you be used as a reference during surgical and surgery, and can shorten surgical procedure time. We don't have hard data on this, and that's one of the things I think going forward, there has to be prospective studies. We're planning on doing that. I think other people are planning on doing that to say, you know, what is helpful, when is it helpful, you know, in what areas is it helpful. But I think you have to start doing it to get that data. So if you wait until there's reimbursement, that's what we say in radiology, you're not going to do it. So you just have to start doing it. Um, and I, so I think a lot of major medical centers are are starting to do it, and I think you're going to see it crop up a lot of more places in the next year. That's the feedback we got from our meeting. You know, when people sent comments back, they said, I didn't know anything about this, or I was wondering about it. I'm going to take it back to my institution. We're going to start doing it. I can see that it's doable. I want to do it. So I think you're going to see this a lot. And again, it's a valuable educational tool for the family. So what Dr. Stans in Pediatric Orthopedics says, it's just the next advancement. You go from, you know, 2D plain films to 3D computer images, and then the anatomic models is really the next step. It's just another way to look at the images that we create. So collaboration is key. Again, it's a collaborative thing between surgeons, radiologists, and biomedical engineers. Um, here's our current lab. Um, Dr. Morris and I direct it. We have physicists. We pull in radiology subspecialists. We have segmenters, uh, machine operators, and engineering support. We have one printer, and we're planning on getting t a second printer within the next few months. And uh, we can see today we have like three printers, and we triage cases depending on the type of cases to the different printers. And then comes back accuracy. How, how do you know how accurate this is or not? You know, and you, it isn't, you have to kind of know that. So a lot of what we're doing now is more relationship, and it's not like down to the micron accuracy. Um, but we, luckily in radiology, we have a lot of protocols in place for accuracy from CT and MR and ultrasound so that we have ways to judge accuracy. So what we've done is we've taken our CT phantoms, uh, we CT them, we take the STLs, we print them, and then we take the printed phantom back and we compare that to the original phantom and we see, well, what is the difference in size? So we know, we know where, you know, what we can say that we're measuring it down to. So, and I think that work is ongoing, because anytime you process something, so you kind of have seen the process of that, where we take it from, you know, the, the data to the segmentation to the processing, you're going to change the data somewhat. And so there's always this change in accuracy, and I think there'll be a lot of work going on in that in the future, so you kind of know exactly how accurate is this. But right now, we're not making anything for implantation or anything like that, and so we're just kind of um, saying this is, you know, within probably a couple millimeters, it's pretty accurate and the relationships are accurate. So, education. Again, that color-coded segmented anatomy is great. It's ideal for teaching. Um, when Dr. Blackman um, did one of the Pancos tumors, she took it to the OR and she happened to take it into pathology. The pathologist saw it and called me up and said, could you make me one of those? 
And I was like, sure, you know, once you have the STL file, you can print as many as you like. And she said, you know, we don't get specimens like this anymore to teach from. Um, it, you know, those days are kind of gone. By the time they get the specimens, they're, you know, they're small, they're fragmented, they're not in one piece. So for her to have that pancos tumor with the brachial plexus, with the ribs, with the vessels, was great for her to teach. And so she's used that for teaching. And we get this from, a, you know, we started to get this from a number of people. You know, could you make me this? I need to teach. Could you make me this? I would like to try simulation on it. So these are just some of the models we use. Um, the heart model is one for catheter placement. The chest model on the right is one that Dr. Blackman developed for VATS procedures. Um, and so we hard printed the ribs um, and the aorta, and then we printed in soft material the pulmonary arteries and veins and uh, trachea, and we're able to implant those um, and so that you can practice VATS procedures on it. Um, so anyway, we feel like we're on the learning curve. Clinical collaboration is key. Learning what look, works, what is useful. This is a thing that you really, sometimes you work hard and it doesn't turn out, and other times it does, and you just have to keep going. Um, we're starting to use research applications, like um, take these phantoms and use them to really optimize imaging, use them to find out different things. Our physicists come in the room and they see the 3D printer and their eyes light up and they're thinking of all the different things they can do with it. It's, it's kind of amazing. Educational opportunities are great. And this is, we just see the medical use of 3D printing increasing exponentially in the coming years. We just think we're on the cusp of it taking off and that people are going to, we feel like if you bring it to surgeons, if you bring it to anybody, there's so many creative, innovative people in medicine, they think of ways to use it. And they come back with ideas to us, and then we try them out. So I think that's what you're going to see happening everywhere. Um, and I want to thank you for having me, and I want to thank you for my lab. Um, we have a lot of very dedicated, passionate people working on this. A lot of nights and weekends, I would say. Um, this is from one of our surgeons, um, Dr. Mike Yazemski, and I don't speak Italian very well, so if somebody does. Um, anyway, it's Vidi Langelo nel marmo e sculpi fino a laborallo. And this is kind of how we feel. Um, you, when you're doing this, you kind of feel sometimes like you're sculpturing, you're chiseling, you know, your, your model. Um, uh, in fact, we have a little sign in front of one of the computers that says chisel, because you kind of chisel away and you make this model. Anyway, I saw the angel in the marble and carved until I set him free. So I want to thank you very much.